Gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for technology. We thank you for the ability to meet even in my strange circumstance and different place. Um, but thank you also for preserving your word and having this study available to us this lesson. Um, all lessons are so important, but there's just sometimes that some lessons are maybe more pertinent, more important, more um, relevant. And I think this is one of them. So we ask that in this different place, in this different setting, that I'm able to focus, that I'm able to, to lead and guide with your Holy Spirit guiding me, and that we come out of this with amazing truth, that we've studied, we're prepared, and your word is going to be there for us to refer back to. And we can um, walk from this point forward in a better way if needed. Uh, we always and ever want that whatever we're studying changes us. And as a result, we um, walk in our, our Christian walk differently. We share with others and it just brings us more and more liberty because that is the hope and the desire from you. We thank you for that in advance, and we ask that you just walk with us through this lesson. We ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Two more people. Um, so welcome to my strange circumstance, <laughs> um, but I'm glad we're here. And um, this week's lesson is the first where we're completely away from the Beatitudes, uh, but we want to remember, like, from where we came. We're, we're talking about the Sermon on the Mount. I do not have a whiteboard, so I'm not going to be getting up and writing down. If you want to create a chart for a list, uh, probably the best would be just one column that says Old Covenant or Law and another column that says New Covenant. And we'll walk through what we can learn about each. And then what the question that going in and the question we want to come out with is, what does the law have to do in the life of a believer? Um, what, what does a believer do with the law? Like, I, I guess that's another way of looking at it. We want to be able to not just answer that question, but uh, this is a, one of those issues that I call grease pig, meaning that we're going to get a really good handle on it. And then it's going to kind of like get out of our, our hands again. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you found that to be true this week in your study or two weeks of study. I, I, this is an, a study I've done. I, I've done the study before. I've done the entire book of Romans before. That was the issue that came up over and over in Romans. Some of you have been with me or for a while. I've talked about this before and still I go through this lesson. I go, okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. And then there it goes again. <laughs> Okay, so understand that's okay, because the Holy Spirit can guide us, um, but I do feel like we can get a really good handle on, and maybe you'll find, maybe you've already found, that there are some areas where the law is concerned that you needed a little bit of, of tweaking. I, 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 it's one of those things that I think is an on going process like all of our christian walk our sanctification is an ongoing process and this is definitely a huge issue in that what does the law have to do in the life of a believer and partly i say that because maybe this has been your experience but i've been in places where basically uh christian churches that would say old testament we don't even need to deal with right not and and i've never been in a place that was like completely like let's just throw it out but basically it would be such an emphasis on we're not under law we're under grace true statement but that emphasis and in saying that doing away with the law okay so we want to make sure we get the balance as god would want us to have that balance so we talked about the beatitudes for se for several weeks wonderful set of things to to look at we know the word blessed has to do with a state of being not with something that we attain on our own efforts or uh, uh an attitude that we have it, it talks more about the characteristics of being a christian not uh becoming a christian there's that's the difference it's like you don't get these things because you try in your efforts really, really hard. It's that now we have the ability to be merciful, to mourn over our sin, to be gentle, to be the different um, things that are listed in the Beatitudes, even Peacemaker and all that. 
because we have the indwelling Holy Spirit, because our state of being is that we are Christian. We can now live this out. So the Beatitudes are great. We saw that they were somewhat progressive. Like you start with understanding your poverty of spirit, mourning over your sin. Um, that's going to lead to you being gentle, hopefully first towards yourself and others. And then having that hunger and that thirst for righteousness. And then mercy, uh, purity of heart, peacemaking. And then guess what? We got to realize persecution's coming. And that Jesus was persecuted. We're going to be persecuted. And I don't know about you, but that's one thing that when persecution happens or when troubles come, and this is as a Christian, as we are living our life for Christ, not just because I've done something bad or I've made somebody mad or anything like that, but um, I have a tendency to react going, why is this happening to me? And instead I should be thinking it happened to Jesus. It's going to happen to me and be, be more expecting of it. Again, not trying to bring it about, <laughs> um, but again, these are persecutions in the name of Christ, um, understanding that. Then we talked last week as we finished up the Beatitudes. When I say last week, I mean last lesson. We finished up the Beatitudes and we talked about being salt and light and being um, one other thing. Uh, well, salt and light. Yeah. First, it was salt. We understood the kind of characteristics of salt and how that should apply to us. And then being light. And we know that light pushes back darkness. Darkness does not overcome light. Um, and we are to be that in the world. Now, this section that we're going into starting this week has to do, oh, we've already, I've already talked about it, but it has to do with what major subject? The law. The law, exactly. Um, it has to do with the law. And so tell me some things in the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to look elsewhere also, but tell me some things that Jesus said about the law. He said he fulfilled the law. He fulfilled it. Yes. So he didn't do what? He fulfilled it, but he did not what? He didn't cancel it. He didn't change it. He fulfilled it. Exactly. So that is one of the hugest things. And so if you want to write down in your column under the law, he fulfilled it. He did not nullify or cancel it, whatever words you want to use there. He didn't abolish. That's another word. Um, he didn't abolish the law. It's, it's a huge thing that we always need to remember. Cause like I said before, sometimes in our Christian settings, we'll say, so very often we're not under law, we're under grace, true statement, but we have a tendency to think that means grace cancels out the law and it does not it does not okay so we gotta we gotta get a, a handle on that um idea okay what else did he say about our handling of the law in the sense of he didn't nullify it what are we not to do It's verse 19, if you want to find the passage. We're supposed to continue to teach it? Yes. Um, anyone who nullifies any part of it and teaches others that is going to be the least in the kingdom. So we are not to teach it that way, you know, so that's the opposite. Um, I thought it was interesting, though, because I had actually picked up on least in the kingdom. In other words, you're still in the kingdom, right? You just kind of like got your toe in the door or your foot in the door. Um, and, and I think that's that's important to understand it, it. Like I've been saying in some places, some you may have encountered this as well. The teaching may have been a little bit off where the law is concerned. That I mean, they're completely wrong or that they're they lost their salvation. But we have a responsibility to the word. We have a responsibility as we're studying, as y'all are studying with me um, to handle it accurately to understand it ourselves and certainly not to go and say, uh, pick and choose 
you know, cut and paste, sometimes we'll say, um, like if we picked up our Bible and saw a bunch of holes in it because we didn't like this passage, so we're going to cut that one out. You know, that's that's not our role. That is not what we are to do. So again, keeping balance where you might want to put under your, your law column or your old covenant column that we are not to annul any of the commandments uh, and we're not to teach that, obviously. Um, but if we keep and teach all of the commandments, then we will be great in the kingdom. So you can put even, you could even put that on the new covenant side, but certainly on, you can put it on the old covenant side because we're really talking about the law, anything we're having to do with the law. Um, but so we also need to remember that righteousness and the law are not, they're tied together, but we also need to understand that relationship as well. Okay. One of the things you looked at through your lesson this week was, can we attain righteousness with the, you know, through the law? Can we attain righteousness apart from the law? Like again, where, where, what's the relationship? Where do we put righteousness? Okay. But one of the things that Jesus talked about right out of the gate was righteousness. And he talks about the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. How does he do a comparison with us or, or what does he say our righteousness needs to be like in comparison to the scribes and the Pharisees? Our righteousness needs to surpass that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Okay. So just for a second, sit yourself in, you know, first century Jewish life. And you're looking at these people, the scribes and the Pharisees around you. How would they have been portrayed to you? What would you have thought as an average Christian, it's not Christian, average Jewish person. <laughs> and let's say even as a Christian, but as an average Jewish person, how would they, what, what would their status be? Well, my initial impression, like hearing somebody say, you need to be more um righteous than them like i'd be like oh my goodness i need to do all these things i need to wear the right clothes and have those little things that go clingy and <laughs> and i need to sacrifice more and pray really loud and like i need to walk around like i'm you know i can't do anything because you know the law says you know and i can't you know and, and lots of man-made rules and regulations and you know like because that was the impression that, and I, I think that's the exact impression every person that would have heard this would have had like a burden, right? Like, like a harder, stronger, more. And, and it, okay. So let's put this in, in more contemporary terms. Um, let's just, you, you fill in the blank with whatever, whether it's your local pastor, whether it's Kay Arthur or, uh, you know, sometimes we'd say somebody like Billy Graham or Mother Teresa or whoever, and, and it could be a, a group because these are groups of people, Pharisees and scribes, put the top dogs in that list and say, you got to be more Christian than them. You got to do more than they do, right? And every one of us would have, the first thought in our heads would have been, you know, like after the big inhale, right? We would have been going, I, I can't, I can't, I, I'm not like that. I can't be. They are so much bigger, better. I mean, so let's put Paul on the list. Let's put obviously Jesus on the list. You know, let's put, you know, any of the, the big names of the Bible in there and say, you've got to, you've got to exceed that. Right. So when Jesus is saying this, this is the feeling. That would have been the thought process. You're absolutely right. That would have been what would have been triggered in your head, right? And you would have thought there, there is no righteousness that exceeds that. But Jesus is talking about a righteousness that exceeds that. And I, I think we know the answer. I mean, we've studied, number one, and we're on the other side of the understanding of this centuries later, um, thousands of years later. But I know as a young Christian reading that, it, it just tied my gut in knots thinking, oh my gosh, I, I, how can I exceed? How can my righteousness surpass that, right? And that's the human thinking. The human thinking is my righteousness, okay? 
So tell me without even knowing what, I, I don't even think we necessarily looked these up this, this week, but Isaiah tells us that my righteousness, my human righteousness is filthy rags. Exactly. I saw the lips. Yes. It's <laughs> filthy rags. Um, he, uh, he meant, if you look that up in the Hebrew, as women, we can understand this menstrual cloths. Yeah. Okay. Which the menstruation was a representation of a death. It's the death of the hope of a pregnancy. Okay. Every time we slough off that, that, that lining of our uterus, um, or did, I don't anymore, but you know, every time we did, it meant no pregnancy, no pregnancy. If you look at the law, it meant unclean. It was a discharge. So it meant unclean. You're unclean during that and you're unclean seven days after that. So no man was supposed to touch you because you were unclean. Okay, now take those cloths and parade them out for the world to see. Yeah, that's your filthy rags. Okay, that, that's your righteousness. No one would do that. Like we, 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 this is something I, I remember when I was junior high, high school, starting to menstruate, you know, if anybody, like a guy would grab your purse or your purse would spill and you'd go in a panic because your personal care products would spill out. And oh my gosh, everybody'd see them. And I'm not talking, I'm talking about the ones in the wrappers, you know, in your butt, right? So it, it may not be so taboo now, but that's, that's, that's the idea here, right? They would have used rags, literal rags. They didn't have the conveniences that we have, but no more would we have paraded those out than, than we need to be proud of our righteousness. So the, the illustration, I, I, I can't make it as bad as I think it needs to be. I'm trying to make it as bad as I possibly can. That's how we need to view our efforts and our righteousness, all right? So Jesus is saying the Pharisees and scribes righteousness, which remember their righteousness is filthy rags. Our righteousness is filthy rags. Our, the righteousness that gets us to heaven has to surpass that. And I would hope it would, <laughs> okay? But it's the, our righteousness, it's the human righteousness that's the problem. And it's what they were counting on and what Jesus is trying to come in and say that never got anybody anywhere, right? It never got them what they thought it was getting them. This is the message of the Sermon on the Mount. This is a radical thought process. And I can only imagine the people listening to it didn't sit there and go, oh, that's good. They had to chew on this thing. They had to think about this. They just like we do, just like we do. And we've got a little, a little bit more completed story and completed text than they would have had. This would have been early on in Jesus's ministry. Um, it's before his death, obviously. So it was somewhere in that three and a half years, this message is being given. And this is radical stuff, radical, radical stuff. Okay. It's still radical. Okay. So I hope every time you read that, that hitch comes in your spirit a little bit and you go and you check yourself and go, okay, okay. You know, what righteousness, what righteousness am I counting on? What righteousness is going to get me to heaven? Okay. So as we go on, if you go on, that's through, through 20 verse 20, um, where Jesus said that the, um, we looked this week at several places. First, we're going to look at the Old Testament and the law and see, like, where did it come from? We looked in Exodus. Tell me kind of the story. Where did the law, how did had they come to have it? Through Moses. Okay. Right. Yes. Through Moses, through that time frame. Obviously, who, who actually gave it to Moses? We got to make sure we... God, God gave it, to them, right? Okay. Um, we know he he went up on a mountain. Um, he came down with tablets of stone. There was a ceremony where there was sacrifices. There was blood. There was blood sprinkled on the people. There was blood sprinkled on the tablets or the book of the laws, it was called. Um, 
there was more written down than what was on the tablets, right? The tablets had the 10, but the law goes on. It, it's, it, it's books worth and they wouldn't have had books like we have, they would have had scrolls. But what was the response of the people when Moses came down and presented it, when Moses spoke it, when Moses read it, twice the people responded saying what? That we will keep the law. All that the law says we will do. Yes, we will keep the law, right? Did they? No. No. <laughs> No. Um, did some of them try? Yeah. Were there some things done? Yeah. Um, but were they able, did they know, were they able to know? So there's, there's a difference in trying and not succeeding. And then sometimes not trying at all. Like they did not succeed in keeping the law, but they professed it. All that the law says we will do. Are we like that? Yeah. In the moment when we're sitting in that pew and maybe after our salvation and after our baptism and we're all cleaned up, we're like, I'm going to live this life. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to do it. Right. And we, we have great intentions, um, but we're not good at it. Why is that? Where, where's the struggle come? The flesh. Yes. We're in this body, right? In this life, in this body, we've got this struggle ongoing. Is that a good excuse? No. <laughs> no. Again, balance. Let's 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 be honest, but let's also not give ourselves any excuses. Okay. So Exodus tells us how we came to have it. Um, the Ten Commandments uh, were given on the tablets of stone. The people were so frightened. They didn't, they saw the reaction on Moses' face. Uh, I mean, the glow on Moses' face. They heard or saw the kind of lightning and thunder and kind of heard the voice of God. And the people cowered and basically said, Moses, you go talk to him. And then you just come back and tell us what he says. You know, you, so Moses was the mediator from the people's standpoint. And the Moses was the mediator from God's standpoint as well. Like Moses was that mediator. What was that a projection of? If Moses was the mediator, who started that? Like, I mean, I'm sorry, who is that? Um, a foreshadowing of Christ. Yes. Jesus is the ultimate mediator. Moses was a mediator of the old covenant. Okay. And one of the things that I don't know that we actually, actually, it was kind of said implied in one of the verses we looked up this week is the new covenant. And you can put this down on your list, even though we haven't gotten there yet is an eternal covenant, an everlasting covenant. Um, the old covenant is not. The old covenant is never called an everlasting or an eternal covenant. It's, and if when some of us have studied covenant, covenant is for life until you die. But this old covenant was never intended to be a forever thing. But Jesus said, there's not one jot or tittle that's going to be altered of the old covenant as long as the earth, the heavens and the earth remain. Now, what do we know is going to happen someday? This is all going away. Okay. So as long as heaven and earth with the remains, no jot or tittle is going to be changed, but there is, there is a time coming. Okay. But the new covenant has no end, has no end. Um, the, in Deuteronomy, it says, if Israel obeyed God's law, then it was righteousness for them. The Lord set the standard for righteousness and laid it out in specific details in his law. Okay. So in the giving of the law in, in you know, the, the Pentateuch, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, we, it, we have in um, Leviticus, we have the giving, with Exodus and Leviticus, we have the giving of the law. Deuteronomy, we have the retelling of the law prior to going into the land. So we have that 40-year period in there where they're 